Hi everybody, welcome to the section 2 video. I'm going to film for you. Um, you will have to wait on the second half of that problem from yesterday, or from class on section 1, just because I didn't bring the tablet that I needed home to do the writing on, so I can't make that particular video. But I am going to go through section 2 on drag forces and just kind of try um, introducing the um, two different big concepts in this one, and one of them is um, the force of drag equation, so how we can measure a different type of friction. So remember, we covered in our first section exactly the, what friction is, what the two different types of friction are. We defined friction as something that has to occur only when two objects are in contact with each other. Um, drag force is going to be more um, defined based on what it's defined based on fluids. And fluids in physics are defined as either liquids or air. Um, so when it comes down to it, liquids or gases, sorry. Um, so when it comes down to it, we can only really have drag forces in those two types of materials. Oh, I apologize. I have a little inside on it. Um, and we're going to learn about some of the calculations. And the calculations that we do in this chapter are very, or in this section, is a very straightforward. There's two different equations, and you just need to learn how to apply the variables that are given for those equations. So let's dive in. So again, we said a drag force is going to be something that opposes an object's motion in a fluid. So in this particular case, we talk about like a boat traveling through water, or we talk about a person free falling, or we talk about an, a balloon rising in the air. And we talk about drag as a resistance to whatever motion that object is currently undergoing in that fluid. And that fluid can be defined as either a liquid or a gas. So that's where we're going to look for drag. And so up until now, we've mostly just ignored air resistance, but air resistance is also known as drag. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how we can actually um, measure drag. Now, for the most part, the magnitude of a drag force is given as a um, proportion to the square of the velocity that the object is traveling. So in other words, if the object is traveling really fast, it's going to have more, more drag. If the object is traveling really slow, it won't have as much drag. And this is something we'll see when we look at different types of um, people diving through the air, like skydivers. Um, it, to see like what would you do in the situation where you're falling and your parachute doesn't open your goal is to make your area as large as possible and we can prove it mathematically in this chapter so um that being said we have our first of the two equations we're going to talk about or three equations that we're going to talk about in this chapter um and this one is the f is the force of drag and this is going to have the variables that we want to account for when we're trying to calculate what that drag force is the first is going to be the drag coefficient so remember that coefficients for the most part are unitless um they tend to be low numbers that range from zero to one um and they also tend to be given numbers based on the fluid itself so if the fluid is water it has a certain drag coefficient if the fluid is um, a gas like our atmosphere then it's going to have its own drag coefficient and so on and so forth a is going to be the area of the object that's actually moving through the fluid so think the difference between like a speedboat that has that triangle up at the top that's to reduce drag from the water um, versus like maybe a person falling in the air if they're falling with like all their limbs extended they're trying to extend the amount of um, area that they take up versus if you're falling or if you're diving in say a pool you try to like enter either feet first or head first to decrease the amount of drag force that your body feels right difference between a belly flop and a perfect dive is that a belly flop hurts because you a lot of you hits the water at one time versus when a dive when you dive in and only your hands hit or only your um, um, head hits right um, P is gonna be the density of the fluid also known as Rho that's a Greek letter looks like a lowercase p whatever um, density of the fluid is gonna de be dependent on the fluid type okay from there we can actually rearrange this equation the force of drag equation um, and make a few assumptions to get our terminal velocity equation which is where we're going with this next that drag coefficient is something that has to be experimentally determined, and so let it. A lot of different objects are experimentally determined using um, what we call a wind tunnel, especially when we're looking at like planes, because our planes and the amount of drag they feel is kind of important for plane physics and how airplanes work. Um, so these are all things that are going to have to have been experimentally de experimentally determined at some point. Okay, um, drag coefficients again are going to depend on velocity, but for us, we're just going to uh, really just assume it's a constant. We're not trying to do some of the really complicated physics. We're just kind of trying to introduce some of the more general stuff. Um, I'm going to look. I'm going to show you a table of drag coefficients here in a second, and it really does depend on the object. Um, 
with cars, remember that you've probably felt a drag or you've probably felt the effect of a car that has a really, um, really like high, like really high, what do you, I don't know what you call it, like if it's a really tall car versus a really uh, well-designed car that has a long front end, you're going to feel that uh, difference in the way that the air on a windy day hits that vehicle. And so a lot of times um, what, what car engineers are trying to do is to reduce the amount of air resistance or drag that your car is feeling because it really helps. It, it strained, like it's, it's, it's incredible how it affects uh, fuel efficiency, right? So the higher profile your vehicle is, the less fuel efficient it is. So think about the difference in gas mileage in like an 18 wheeler truck versus a tiny little Prius, right? Like a Prius gets amazing gas mileage, partially Partially because of the electric, yes, but also partially because of the way that it's designed to kind of let air flow over it instead of it being hit in the face by it, okay? And that's not the first time we're going to talk about things like high profile versus low profile vehicles. And here we have a couple of different vehicles just kind of to give you an idea. If you've heard of these vehicles or you own one of these vehicles, then you see that the drag coefficient, that letter on the right side of our column, um is smaller for lower profile vehicles and for vehicles that are designed to allow air to pass over them versus something like a Hummer, which is basically just a box on wheels, right? Doesn't, not really aerodynamic, if you will. Um, from there, we talk about um, some other types of objects like a skydiver when they're diving feet first or a skydiver when they're trying to spread themselves out um, and so on. Okay, here this is a good, another example, just like uh, this is a... Uh, an example of how swimwear can be designed to reduce the drag force that the body feels. Um, and these are like specially designed suits um, that are literally designed to allow drag forces to go down, right? They decrease the coefficient of friction from, from skin, which isn't really that rough in the first place, to even lower than what it already is. Okay. Um, okay. So then from there, we want to kind of move away from liquid and talk a little bit about air because the most common... Um, the most common fluid that we analyze objects in would be the atmosphere. And so in this particular case, we're going we're gonna to consider a, um, a skydiver and we're going to consider them falling under just gravity, right? So jumps out of the plane, starts falling towards the ground. The forces that are acting on him are the force of gravity pulling him downward and the drag force, which is acting opposite of his motion. That gravity is going to be constant, which is which is a good thing, right? Gravity doesn't change. Um, if at some point the skydiver stops accelerating, right? We call that person um, then moving at terminal velocity. So that term, terminal velocity, implies that they cannot speed up any longer. It means that the force of gravity is equal to the um, opposite force of the drag coefficient. And in this particular case, um, that happens at only a very certain point, and we're going to call that point terminal velocity. Um, so since that's happening, the force of drag, which is going to point upward since the person's falling down, is going to be equal to weight, which is that force of gravity pulling on that skydiver. Because of that, we can make a couple of assumptions, and this is the derivation, right? So the top part of this is just the assumptions we're making about weight and the force of drag. When the person stops accelerating, then his net force is zero and the weight vector is going to equal the force of drag. So we can put that equation that we just introduced in the force of drag in as well as the weight vector rearranged to solve for V and what we can find is an equation down here for the terminal velocity of anything once it gets to that certain point. Okay, That means the fastest it can possibly move. Okay, so for here we have our first example and this is going to be a 75 kilogram skydiver descending head first. So that means a very, very small area, right? Think like your body just kind of like your arms at your side and you're falling straight down with your head pointed downward. Okay. So your area spread out over whatever it would be, if you're like that, is going to be 0 0.18 meters squared. You also were given a drag coefficient, again, fluid dependent. And you were asked to calculate the terminal velocity. 
So then we're going to plug numbers in. So here on the left, I've gone through and I've defined each of my variables. We were told that C is 0 0.7. We were given the mass. We know that the, um, the uh, co coefficient for air, the drag coefficient, was 1.21. Um, we know the area was 0.18. We know what gravity is, and we know what the equation is. So then we go ahead and we plug everything in, and we end up with a very, very fast um, terminal velocity. Okay, and this is this is pretty fast. Like you don't probably don't really want to move this fast when you're a human being, but that's what our terminal velocity would be if we didn't have any way of slowing ourselves down. Now, in real life, we do have a way of slowing ourselves down. And what we can do is we can actually fall in what we would call a spread eagle, right? So spread everything out as far as you can. And when you spread your arms and your legs out, you um, increase the amount of area that your body covers as it falls through that medium. And so we're going to change the equation just slightly. Um, the mass goes up to 85. I don't know why they aren't the exact same, but, you know. Um, and we were given some other pieces of information that the coefficient is 1. Um, I'm sorry, that the drag coefficient is still 1.21 because that's specific to air. That the coefficient um, C is going to be 1. And then we were told that an adult's area is something like 0.7 when you spread it out. Okay? And then we're going to plug those numbers in and we see that our velocity, our terminal velocity, goes down quite a bit right? It goes down by more than half in this particular scenario. Now, again, this person's a little bit, um, weighs a little bit more, has a couple of different things happening, but really the big term that changes on the bottom of this fraction is the area term. And that changes how fast that person is moving. And so when you are, if you are ever in the situation where your parachute won't open, spread eagle and protect your head. Those are your two pieces of advice based on physics. Um, from there, we can talk a little bit about Stokes' Law, and we'll come back to Stokes' Law in the, in the future, but another way of kind of just talking about um, uh, the force of drag versus um, the force uh, versus the velocity, right? So this is slightly different. Um, if the object is super small, that drag equation doesn't really hold true. And small, small objects don't have a lot of mass, that's why. Um, or if it's in a um, any medium that is a little bit more heavy than air, right? So a denser medium than air, say water. Um, so in that particular case, uh, we have to find the, we have to use Stokes' Law. So this is going to be the force based on Stokes' law. You would need the radius of the object, again, small objects only. Um, we would need the viscosity of the fluid. So we're talking something much denser than air. Think water, think molasses, think anything liquidy, basically. Um, and then V is going to be the object's velocity. And so we can use that particular equation to solve for different problems. Again, what do you need to know? You need to make sure you know R, you need to make sure you know the N, and then you need to make sure you know V in order to calculate F. Uh, from there, just kind of remember that the reason why there are two different ways to calculate that force as something moves through either through any type of fluid um, it has to do with the fact that when we drop different objects, they move differently, right? Like we've we all know that if we put everything in a vacuum, it's going to fall at the same rate. That's what gravity tells us. But in reality, there isn't gravity. There isn't a vacuum for us to drop a bunch of objects in. In reality, we have to deal with air and we have to deal with water and we have to deal with different fluids that are going to make things more dense or less dense. Think like fog versus just plain atmosphere um, and so on. So kind of think about the Galileo experiment, that original experiment where he drops objects from the tower and he measures, he, he records how long it takes for them to hit the ground. Small objects took longer. Large objects took less time. Small objects had to deal with things like larger areas. Small objects had to deal with things like um, smaller masses. They had to deal with more drag because of certain factors. And so Galileo is really the first person who notices, like, what should happen is everything should hit the ground at the same time. And the heavier objects did do that. But the feather doesn't do that, right? The feather has to deal with more area spread out over a longer distance compared to its mass. Um, one of the other things that we want to kind of think about is our gravitational force is very different than, say, that of the moon or that of another planet. 
Um, our gravitational force is very unique to Earth. Other objects on different planets would fall at different rates and have different terminal velocities because the gravitational pull would be either less or greater, depending. 